Thank you very much for the, the warm introductions and thank you all for coming this evening. So here's the contents of the presentation. I'm not going to, to read them out. I will just crack on, but we've got quite a lot to, uh, to get through, so I won't delay. A bit about our company, as has already been mentioned. We're uh, an independent renewable uh, energy engineering consultancy with a head office in Glasgow. And since 2002, we've managed to get a, a global footprint uh, establishing offices uh, throughout the world. Uh, we're a professional outfit. We put a lot of uh, emphasis on our QA standards. And uh, we've managed to grow that business to over 100 uh, engineers and consultants. And what do we do? We're involved in the full uh, project life cycle. We get involved in projects from inception right through to construction and uh, indeed operation. And I think that's what makes us quite a favourite company with the, the banks and financial institutions who rely on us for a lot of due diligence work because we understand projects and we stay with them. We're involved in all renewable energies, not just wind energy. And that just gives you an idea of some of the types of project we're involved in. And there's our global footprint. We've consulted in over 45,000 megawatts of uh, renewable energy in over 30 countries. Uh, all these projects haven't obviously been built because our job in many respects is to, to weed out poor projects and help identify the, the better ones. So apologies in advance if there's any meteorologists in the audience. I thought we'd outline just how the wind works. Uh, it's a fairly simple model. At the uh, equatorial uh, zones, we get uh, more sunlight and at the polar regions less. And that basically sets up a transfer of energy from the equatorial zones to the poles, creating wind. And uh, there's three cells shown here that uh, I'll show in a bit more detail in this slide. The same cells. Here is an equatorial position, and we've got a lot of energy coming in, and uh, the uh, air rising, condensing. And that's what we're calling the, the Hadley cell. And basically when this air comes down, it spreads north and south and starts to feed a second cell, the feral cell. Scotland's located round about here at the junction of these two cells. And uh, yeah, we get a, a lot of rain, but also a lot of wind. And that's what, what gives us wind in that area. It's a mixing of the two cells from the the polar north and the mid latitudes. Uh, wind shear, the variation of uh, wind speed with height, wind speed along this axis, height along this axis. It's fairly extreme right in the zone that we want to stick our wind turbines. Uh, you would be better in areas where it's less extreme. But uh, we have to put the turbines close to the ground, so that's what we have to try and engineer our way round. How do we cope with these extremes of uh, environment? And uh, it gets worse. We've got hills <laughs> that compress the flow. And you stick a wind turbine on top, you've got a lot of turbulence behind. You can get flow separation. So if your machine's sitting downwind, you've got potential fatigue issues. You've got cliffs. You find a lot of these in Texas, places like that. If you put your turbine too close to the cliff edge, you could be operating in a zone of recirculation, which can affect performance and life of the, the machines. And uh, there's a lot of talk at the moment of trying to install wind turbines on industrial locations. And uh, you couldn't get a more complicated environment. There's wind flow behind a building. And we use rules of thumb like this. You've got to be 10 times the height of an obstacle uh, away, and uh, the rotor has to be the height of the obstacle above a zone of high turbulence, otherwise you run into operational issues. But uh, the bottom is guesswork. This is modelling, which is interesting, but not necessarily telling you exactly what's going on. And then trees, they are, they are even worse. Uh, we get uh, <laughs> extreme uh, wind shear behaviours exaggerating the, the other wind shears I showed and very, very high levels of turbulence. So 
you begin to wonder uh, about the about sticking wind turbines anywhere. Uh, <laughs> so, someone dragged this out of a, a, a textbook for me. I'd forgotten it from university, but basically we've got a, a flat plate model, or you could have a pipe or whatever. So you've got a laminar or turbulent zone, but relatively quickly you're coming to a, a uniform wind speed. The atmosphere, uh, completely different environment. This is going up to 1.2 kilometers here, 100 to 300 meters. So wind turbines operating in this zone. And uh, what we're showing here is you've got two completely different behaviors uh, during the course of a 24-hour day, from sunset to sunrise, and then bring into that seasons. So you don't get the same conditions for a second. It's always changing, and your turbines have to cope with that. And we try and model it as best we can. Conventional modeling uh, gives you reasonable answers, but tends to overpredict on the upward slopes and underpredict at the, the top of hills. And uh, it gets used regularly without people fully understanding the limitations of, of modeling. This is a fairly coarse model. You've got better computational fluid dynamics models, but we struggle to get these to match with real answers we get from the field. <coughs> So the models are there, they're going the right direction, but they're still restricted. So as a consequence of all these difficulties, uh, people often get it wrong. And they get it wrong because characteristics of wind have a significant effect on performance, meaning the energy, predict the energy production is less than predicted. And the turbines don't last as long as what they should, sometimes suffering catastrophic failures. And these characteristics are turbulence, as I mentioned, you get from trees or obstacles or adjacent turbines. Shear and veer, uh, shear is the rate of change of wind speed with height. Veer is a change of wind speed, uh, wind direction as you progress vertically upwards. And that's often simply not looked, it's not considered a lot of uh, wind projects. We've got flow inclination, flow hitting a, a wind turbine uh, rotor at an angle and extreme wind speeds. The climate change brings a lot of uh, issues trying to predict these. So, getting it wrong. There was a recent American wind energy conference where uh, three prominent wind energy consulting firms kind of converged on a, with these statements saying that what's actually happening with wind farms is about a 10% underperformance. So what's being predicted? and what's being observed are mismatched by 10%. It's not plus or minus 10%, it's minus 10%. So there's something wrong in the way we go about our business. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what, what we could have done about this one. But, uh, we've got an issue here, Kentish Flats. It's a major wind farm. Every gearbox had to be taken out of the turbines and replaced. These are machines that had less than one year of operation. It shouldn't happen. Uh, the power curve, we've got wind speed along this axis and the, the power going up this axis. It should follow the black line, but uh, clearly doesn't. So, <laughs> something going wrong there. And the owner of this turbine didn't actually notice that this was a problem because it was windy. And they, <laughs> They saw their production was hitting budget. I thought everything's all right. And there are some other examples of getting it wrong. Uh, a generator fire. That's a tower collapse, a wind turbine there. This machine went into overspeed during commissioning. Um, someone got the, <laughs> the, the extreme wind speed wrong in this particular ridge. And uh, we've had a, a little bit of damage on <laughs> all, of, all of the turbines. And I don't know what happened there. Someone must have got their sums completely wrong. And that one got blown right over. But you can also get it right. And getting it right, I think you have to ask some questions. Have turbines got too big too quickly? I would say yes. Do we understand the environment within which they work properly? Uh, I would say probably not. There's a lot of room for improvement. Is management of operational assets the right focus? Again, I think not. But just look at what has happened. This is 1985 down here. 
that's when I first got involved in wind farm, uh, wind turbine development. In 25 years, uh, well, we're up here. There's actually seven megawatt machines, uh, six and seven megawatt machines in the market. To put things into context, that's the world's biggest passenger aircraft. That's the A380 Airbus. So the pace with which wind is developed is exceptional. And I don't think that the understanding is kept pace with that. Um, this will develop. This is a, a model of uh, risks associated with a wind farm. You've got measurement errors here in your space domain. It's your, your site, your wind farm development. You've got modeling uncertainty. So those models I described trying to apply information give you this wide error in the space domain. You know, the data set, your measurements, they're only representative of where they're measuring. And you've got your time domain where you, uh, you're assuming that the, the future is going to be like the past. And you're also trying to make estimates as to, to what might happen with regard to, to climate change. So we're only looking at part of the, the project life cycle here and trying to consider how we might deal with modelling elements of it and how we might deal with operation should things be different to <coughs> what you modelled. And uh, we've come up with a device, we call it Galley, and it's a, a LiDAR device, state-of-the-art wind capture tool. And this is based on observations that I've been making for the, in excess of 20 years on issues surrounding wind farm developments and the, the technology. So we're not interested just in wind speed and direction. As I mentioned, we need to understand about wind shear, wind veer, flow inclination. We have to have a really good understanding of these characteristics of the wind at any given location. Not just the mast, but where all the turbines are going. So LiDAR, that's a LiDAR device which is uh, sitting, sitting in Spain. Um, it's a mature technology. It's been around for a very long time. And we are applying this to, uh, to wind energy. It's a very compact device. I'll show you a bit more about that in a minute. We can acquire all the data that we're interested in with regards to wind flow, uh, wind character. We can measure at the turbine locations. Uh, this device has got a rotating head. So it doesn't just look upwards like a, a meteorological mast. It can be rotated and effectively measure wind speed two kilometers distant in a hemisphere of two kilometers radius. So we can cover a lot more space and validate your wind flow models. So where we've been making predictions, we can actually get real data and make sure those models are doing what they should be doing. And we have been using it for and will continue to look at performance issues, why turbines are not behaving the way in which they should. It just gives you a bit of scale that's a deployment uh, just before Christmas. And what does it do? Well, there's microscopic particles that travel at the same speed uh, as air. So you have a laser beam that's of a uh, wavelength that's small enough to reflect off of those particles. And we use the principle of Doppler shift to establish what the, the wind vector is. And we should get a little sequence and the device tells you what the wind speed was at that location that you were looking at. It in fact, tells you the wind speed right along the, the laser beam at whatever gates you've set up to, to capture that information. <coughs> and here are some results. And basically what we have uh, here is, in this side, this is direction. And you'll notice it's just on a loop. You're getting quite uh, extreme behaviours in direction. And the direction isn't the same all the way through the vertical profile. It's very interesting uh, when you try and consider the forces that are on a rotor and uh, the assumptions that are made behind designing a wind turbine rotor because they're not necessarily what we are ob observing in the field. And this is a part I find more interesting. <coughs> this, to my knowledge, is the first wind turbine uh, rotor wake it's been captured by LiDAR. So this is a plan view. We're looking down on a, a turbine. Uh, here's the rotor, and that's the wake. It did work. 
So we subtract all the, the noise, and that is the wake from a wind turbine. So we're able now to look at the structure and correctly position wind turbines such that they're not affected by neighbouring machines. Up until now, we've been reliant on putting smoke canisters on the end of turbine blades or modelling. So this is a major, a major step <coughs> forward. This again is a plan view. Um, there's three turbines here because the machine's situated on the ground. It's looking obliquely up across the machines, but we've got a turbine here, one here, and one here that comes into view. So you're seeing more of the top of that one. So weight behaviour changes with wind speed. We're just beginning to, to capture information. We've only had this device live since the tail end of last year. So we're begin beginning to see behaviours and uh, compare them with what conventional theory thinks. This here, we have two turbines. There's a machine here, there's another one here. And you can see they're orientated quite differently. Um, but they're subject to the same nominal wind, uh, wind regime. There's actually a section of trees here, and the trees are changing the direction of the wind as the wind blows over them. So we're able to visualise this now. I think it's fantastic. I'm quite excited by it. I'm not sure what this was, but someone said it would look nice. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you basically got the device scanning. It's uh, doing a, a rotation, so you've got blue shift and uh, red shift, red shift coming towards you, blue shift going away from you. I think I'll get it on a t-shirt. <laughs> where the device is coming into its own is this environment, the forestry environment. It's just what I was saying earlier, the, the head can rotate 180 and 360 so we can cover a hemisphere. But we set it up in this instance just to look at wind flow over that forestry, and that's forestry on a hillside. And that's the result. This is just showing signal strength. This is just a reflection. So what we're seeing here is the hillside. So the, the laser's giving us the high return uh, off the hillside, the blue line, and the trees, which is the, the red area. If we put the actual uh, data in, so these are the real measurements from a device this is the wind coming towards you, coming towards this point, and the wind is moving away. And basically what that means is that the, the trees are causing a phenomenon, recirculation. Uh, so you're getting recirculation because the trees are on a hillside, and this is not something that any textbooks or modeling would tell you. So real observations um, with this device are giving us real insight into the behaviour of uh, wind. So we can avoid putting turbines in locations that are uh, potentially damaging next to, to forests. And there's also many issues with operation. I suggested that perhaps wind turbines were not being operated in a manner to which they, they could be. I showed you that power curve. So that's our simple model of a, a wind turbine, a wind turbine performance. Uh, we've got our input, all these parameters to do with the wind behaviour, the system, the part that turns the wind energy into electricity, and the output, the energy, information from the, the, the SCADA system. Supervisory data, uh, supervisory control and data acquisition it typically consumes 10 minute, uh, stores 10 minute averages of uh, wind speed, power, whatever. So the LiDAR device I just mentioned can help us in here. Traditional vibration-based condition monitoring can help us with the, the state of the, the system. But uh, we came up with a software tool that uh, looks at a fingerprint, if you like, of a power curve or other parameters and looks at deviations from that and flags up uh, issues. Why is it important? And here's the part technical losses, and that's energy production from a wind farm. And the reckoning is under performance, just poor performance of the machines could be one to three percent of annual production. And uh, you can do something about that. You can generally do something about availability if you understand the system condition. So we're looking at 
three to nine percent more energy you could potentially get from operating wind turbines. And that's just a, an indication as to reducing energy by percent what it does to the the profitability of your project. It crashes fairly rapidly. If you get it wrong, uh, you're suddenly in a, a loss-making business. And uh, this graph is just illustrating what happens over the typical 20-year life of a wind turbine, depending upon whether you use some sort of proactive maintenance regime as opposed to a reactive one. It'll more than pay for itself. But people don't tend to worry about this down here, which is when you should be characterizing your, your machines. And these are even worse than the other ones. This is a power curve that should be following again that black line. Um, surprisingly here, we're beating the laws of physics and exceeding the batch limit. And uh, this is due to uh, incorrect calibrations in the, in the cell anemometry. Up here, we think it could potentially be pitch misalignment. These are actually from China. So we've observed in China that the rate of change of wind direction is much greater. Uh, in that area compared to Europe. And the turbines have got European control algorithms, so I don't think they're keeping pace with the direction the wind's coming from as fast as what they might. So there's pitch misalignment or uh, a directional issue here. And we've illustrated just how much energy is being lost. That's causing that turbine to lose about 10% of its annual production. And uh, here's another machine which has got issues with its instrumentation. <coughs> Well, the premature overspeed, it's starting to shut down. Uh, it should be doing it up here at 25 metres per second, but it's shutting down at about 15 metres per second. Uh, we actually fixed that by introducing a software change. It didn't really cost anything, but that was worth about 1% of annual production. And that's where we bring in Square Trend. How do you find these uh, anomalies? What we've managed to do is distill a power curve down into a single point. Here at zero, zero, a point there means that the power curve is basically pretty much identical to the reference power curve to its specification. And on this, what we're calling the main sequence, uh, you move up and down there dependent on the behavior of these other parameters, wind shear, or wind veer, turbulence. But if you're out on this flare, uh, there's, there's something wrong. And that you're being directed to look at these anomalies. So, as I said, that's a typical power curve. That's what it should look like. And uh, there's the one I showed you earlier. Um, so immediately you're getting... It's being flagged up that there's a problem with these machines. And the farther you are from this main sequence, the bigger the problem. In this instance, that problem is costing you 19% of your annual energy production and therefore revenue. So using tools like this, we can very quickly um, identify underperforming machines and improve that. What we have here is its time along the x-axis and error code on the y-axis. What we're looking, here, looking at here is uh, the duration and frequency of alarm codes. So some of the catastrophic failures that I showed you, I know that these could be prevented if you suddenly get a, a series of the same fault happening again and again. The SCADA system could take control and shut a machine down because it sees something that hasn't happened for a year. We can do even more than simply count uh, alarm events. We can get in behind how much energy is potentially being lost uh, due to that event. Um, we've got a downtime loss, which could be the grid out, for example. But we're also calculating this performance loss. So this is something you can do something about, whereas you can't do anything about the grid. So we can tackle uh, individual errors. You can focus in on which error is costing you most money and get in and fix it. And this is something I never actually thought that we would be able to do, but we can. Uh, down here is a it's a simple trace. This is simply looking at the temperature at either end of a, a, a generator. <coughs> There's a driven end and the non-driven end bearing temperatures. And this is what a normal turbine looks like. The temperatures are very close. Up here, we looked at, historically, a failure of a generator. 
and you can see that there's a slight gap emerging between those two temperatures. So trending that, you would see a delta, you would flag up an alarm, and you would go and look at this machine and probably find out it's out of alignment, and that's potentially what's causing things to heat up. But they replaced that machine and it failed again, exactly the same way. I don't know what's peculiar about that machine. But we can predict failure using 10-minute averages of SCADA data. I thought you would need to have uh, online condition monitoring to do that. This is a vibration center that's sensor that's typically fitted to um, a turbine. That's normal behavior. That's that behavior there. And as you can see, it's going off the scale there. So again, you'll get some warning of a deterioration of a gearbox. So simply by looking at data that's already there, that's already being produced by the machine, we can get a much better understanding of the behavior of our wind turbines. And it pays, it pays handsomely if we can get in and, uh, and deal with these, these problems. And the key thing is the rapidity of us being able to do performance assessment. Finding those anomalies rather than looking at 100 machines in a, a wind farm, you're being directed towards the ones that are, have a, a genuine problem. And the cost of doing this, I think, is uh, more than offset by the benefits. So there's a summary so far. I think wind is very simple, but uh, where we uh, deploy wind turbines, the structure's quite compl uh, complicated. And it gets increasingly complicated when we introduce obstacles and trees and what have you. I think the current modeling techniques and the size of wind turbines leave operators exposed to risk, but it's a risk that we can now uh, quantify, particularly with the, the device that I mentioned, the LiDAR device. And we can undertake analysis of data that's already there. I used to work for a utility company, and I know that they stored gigabytes of it on their uh, various mainframes, but never did any analysis. Okay, so what is the future? Well, the renewable energy future in the UK has largely been driven by European Union targets. So we've got to meet a 15% energy target, that's electricity and all forms of energy, heat and road transport fuel. And to do that, electricity supply in this country is probably have to go into move from around 5% today to about 29% by 2020. There will be a contribution from individuals and householders through the feed-in tariff, I imagine, which might be around 1% or 2% of the, uh, the total requirement. But we need to start using renewable heat. So everyone has to put in a log burner uh, before 2020. It is quite a big, a big ask. It's a big step. Here's the, the rough makeup of it. Offshore wind is a big component, and uh, for those of you that like wind turbines, onshore wind is also likely to be a, a big component of it. Obviously making a contribution, but much smaller are the other recognised renewable energy technologies. And that's just a bit more of a breakdown as to the various individual <coughs> devices, you know, looking at air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, everything making a a contribution at a domestic and industrial uh, level. And there's probably too much to try and talk in detail about what the future of renewable energy might be, but <coughs> i put down some other things we might need to consider. The key thing is the electricity transmission distribution, because without an upgrade to our uh, UK system, we simply cannot have the amount of renewable energy on our system to meet the 2020 targets. Energy storage, I think, is going to be critical to the amount of penetration that we can get from uh, renewable, store, uh, renewable energy. <coughs> Indeed, energy conservation is a, a central point. Whenever I'm asked about uh, what uh, renewable energy source is good for a particular application, that's where I start. I mean, how can you reduce your energy consumption? It should always be the first consideration. We're making progress in clean coal and carbon capture. I think nuclear is an inevitability. Uh, marine energy, we had an announcement today that there's 1.2 gigawatts of licenses for the Pentland Firth, uh, 600 megawatts for wave, 600 megawatts for tidal. 
uh, Strathclyde University has set up a doctoral training centre. They just opened that yesterday. The intention is to take, I think it's 10 students a year for the next four years, up to a complement of about 40 uh, PhDs running on the uh, subject of, of wind energy. But there's too much to talk about there, and as I started with wind, I'll, I'll just continue. So that's where we're at at the moment, or at least in 2008. 120 gigawatts, around about 3% of the global electricity demand. Where are we going? Uh, we're going bigger, and we're going offshore. That's Enercon's flagship product. Um, I've been in a, a 5 megawatt turbine, and the inside of it, I guess, was approaching the dimensions of this, this room. And it's, a, it's a huge... That's a huge uh, nacelle sitting up there. There's already concepts for 7.5 and, and 10 megawatt machines, so... I don't think you'll see these uh, onshore. Uh, you'll definitely see them offshore. Wind farms are getting bigger. Uh, Utility-scale wind farms. The first large-scale wind farms I was involved in were limited to 15 megawatts. And now the standard building block for uh, offshore wind is about 500 megawatts. We've got London Array, which is a 1,000 megawatt uh, offshore wind farm in the Thames Estuary. Greater Gabbard, it's 500 megawatts. So we're getting much bigger uh, wind farms. And the geographic spread uh, to perhaps cope with the recent high-pressure weather we had when there was no wind will help limit the uh, impact of uh, low wind speed periods. You know, obvious reasons for going offshore, bigger turbines, uh, less noise, better wind resource. What's against it? Well, capital cost of going offshore is, we are seeing about two to three times per megawatt more compared to onshore. So it's quite a considerable uh, subsidy is required to uh, get these machines offshore. These are the, the plans. For Scotland, we've got 6.4 gigawatts of sites. These are the numbered sites. These ones around here. 6.4 gigawatts is about what Scotland has installed of everything, of nuclear and coal, and hydro, wind. So the only way you can have 6.4 gigawatts is if you improve the infrastructure, if we connect to Europe. If we improve storage, you'll never get that in wind unless you can actually evacuate the power. Uh, the UK generally has got quite big targets. Uh, these are the pink areas and they extend all the way down here around, uh, around the south coast. And you're looking at 25 to 30 gigawatts. That's about half of what the UK has currently got. There's about 70 gigawatts of installed everything in the UK at the moment. Germany. Uh, we're looking at similar uh, amounts of offshore wind. It's a European offshore uh, business. It's probably 80 or 90 gigawatts in size. It's a huge, huge opportunity. And all of these, to my knowledge, all of these projects uh, are being progressed through the sort of environmental assessment stage, uh, wind characterization stage that I hope that I will get involved in. Yeah, Beatrice, that's what we have here on the left. It's a five megawatt turbine that's uh, up and running. Uh, and there's another one. So it's just two different ways of installing them. That's a monopile. That's a jacket. It's 45 metres water depth. It's not economically viable. But it was uh, done as a demonstration. The machine was lifted in a single lift by this monster of a vessel behind it. Where are we going? We're getting new concrete wind turbine towers have been around for a while, but there's now designs that are making them in situ. Composite towers, um, going back to uh, mixtures of tubular and lattice. We're getting improved uh, materials, condition monitoring and performance monitoring, as I measure, uh, mentioned. And some of the issues that I've discussed, there's actually developments to have individual uh, pitch control, you already get that in a blade where a blade can operate independently, but actually have it to op respond to its environment. Like put LiDAR on the blade, look at the wind that's approaching and make control decisions. So that improves the, uh, lets you put less material in the machines and uh, improves performance.
gearless designs, the main manufacturers I'm aware of are considering dropping gearboxes because they've been a bit of a, an Achilles heel and uh, going for direct drive. I think that will become the dominant uh, type of turbine offshore. Superconductors, um, there's a, a company I was talking to recently, they reckon they can get significantly more power out of the same space using superconductors. So it's, you'll see generators shrink in size and reduce in weight and increase uh, their production. And grid management, I think that's critical. The whole grid management issue that underpins the ability to actually uh, evacuate and make use of the power. Um, I've already spoken about performance monitoring, but forecasting, I think weather prediction has been able to anticipate three week long periods of uh, high pressure that sits over your country and takes away the wind. Is, uh, it's useful to know that. <laughs> so where are we going? We're looking about three times as much wind power by the time we get to 2013, and that might be approaching 10% of the electricity generated, if only the amount of electricity generated on the planet stayed still, but it continues to grow quite rapidly also. So conclusions. <coughs> Extracting energy from wind is a complex process and I don't believe it's fully understood due to the exponential growth of the industry over the last few decades. So I think there's huge opportunities for research and development in this industry and uh, we're just one company and we've come up with a couple of uh, innovations. So I think with the right support mechanisms, political will, that renewable energy can make a significant contribution to global energy consumption in the coming decades. And I believe wind will continue to be at the, the forefront of this. So thank you very much. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. I think uh, there are a lot of things I'm sure people want to ask questions on. There are microphones, one on each side. If you'd like to indicate uh, that you want to ask a question, then I'll try to get a microphone to you. Um, usual rules of engagement, please. Questions brief um, are helpful, because then more people can ask questions. It's quite helpful, too, I think, to the person answering the questions, to other people in the audience. If you just say who you are, and if you come from a particular organization, then to, to, to say that, too. So who, who would like to start with a question? In the front, front row, um, three along. There's been a lot of work done looking at global temperatures and how they've gone up with climate change, whether you believe that or not. But has any work been done in terms of looking at, you know, they say Scotland's going to get warmer and wetter in the winters, but is it going to get windier or less windy? We have, we have done some work on that. Um, we looked at the uh, seven or eight recognized uh, climate models and over the period of interest, which is nominally 20 years, the uh, nominal life of a, a wind turbine, uh, we're seeing an imperceptible change in average wind speeds. So we don't think it will have a significant effect on energy production. It's within the uncertainty we already attribute to uh, energy production. The biggest risk is potentially on the extreme winds and the frequency of them. And as I showed, they're quite difficult to predict. Thank you. Um, half, halfway back, about three in. If you could please give, give, give your name and if you're any organization too. Uh, Charles Scott, a retired consulting engineer. I'd just like to ask uh, your opinion in, in respect to offshore wind farms. You indicated uh, uh, additional cost and in installation and also in maintenance. Do you think the offshore can become as economic as onshore without enormous subsidies? Um, I would say that's totally dependent upon the price of oil. Uh, I believe that uh, oil or petrol is due to increase to right about £1.20 a, a litre. So I think it's all a, a relative thing. Uh, today, uh, no. It's not economic 
I think with the advances that we're looking at in terms of manufacture, uh, I was in uh, Houston last week, and there's a company there who has been involved in some of the 6,000 uh, offshore installations that are extracting oil and gas from the Gulf of Mexico. And it believes it can produce uh, wind turbine foundations and towers for offshore cheaper than the, the Chinese. And that's down to their knowledge of uh, offshore engineering. So I think if the offshore sector, the offshore oil and gas sector, starts talking to the uh, offshore wind people, you might see some uh, benefits there and reductions in cost. And there's also issues of access. Uh, people are finding out the hard way when it comes to uh, accessing offshore uh, wind farms. The economies of scale help bring down cost. So I think oh, the cost will come down and will it be economic? It will depend upon the, the price of oil. Thank you. Um, front, about four rays back, uh, gentleman in white, Sean. You've mentioned storage a couple of times. <clears throat> Would you like to comment on uh, what storage mechan mechanisms you think are likely to meet the demand for, let's say, a, a few days of storage? Uh, Could they include superconductors? I know nothing about superconductors. <laughs> uh, storage that I've seen that works well with wind uh, is megawatt-sized flow batteries. That's been used successfully, uh, not just for uh, wind, but for uh, locations that are at the end of an electricity grid, where it's cheaper to put in a local flow battery to meet fluctuations and to meet peaks in power demand than it is to put in a bigger conductor. So flow batteries is where my money would go. But I'm going to go and find out about superconductors now. <laughs> front, front track. And, uh, and then the gentleman in the standing of the doorway. Thank you, John Baxter, a fellow of the Society and also a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering from BP. Um, I'm just intrigued with the challenge and the dilemma that we have of, uh, on the one hand, the politicians talk very positively about wind, and I've heard Alex Salmon say that Scotland can be powered by wind alone. Maybe that's hot air from Edinburgh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> alongside the fact that you know, most of us, I used to be a utility engineer, have a duty and a feeling that we should give continuous power supply to our customers. And where you have small remote locations, you might be able to use the battery at the end of the line, etc. But where you have the big conurbations with millions of people, we need continuity of supply. And so I'm just intrigued in this dilemma we've got that we need large power generation, in my view, you know, and wind will be a component, but wind, hydro, coal, gas, nuclear, etc. Because I think the politicians are getting wooed by wind to a point that perturbs me as someone who would like to pass on to the next gen generation continuity of supply that I've had in my lifetime. So I'd really welcome you know, your kind of perspective there, Ian, because it's something that I'm not convinced we're yet uh, getting the message across. Okay, well, I agree with you. <laughs> I mean, it's just a hard fact that uh, you cannot have an intermittent source as your, your major uh, source of power on a network, and, and that's a fact. Um, one of the very early projects I was involved in was a small wind diesel scheme on the Isle of Muck, which is in the small isles on the west coast of Scotland. It's not connected to a grid. It uses uh, wind turbines, uh, storage and a diesel generator. And what we managed to do in that particular uh, island, just 10 years ago, coming up for the 10th anniversary in fact, was we put in a, an intelligent grid where we managed the loads in that grid. So we use radio telemetry to switch um, resistive loads on and off in people's houses. And that got the penetration of wind up to 80%. And that's what you would have to do in any grid to have any chance of getting that level of wind penetration, you need to manage the whole network. Thank you. Gentleman standing in the, in the doorway. And, and then come to in, into the centre about seven days back. Hi, my name is Patrick Crowsdale. I represent P4P Energy. I'm curious as to what you would say cross-industry investment is going to play into the development of further renewable energy sources. For instance, solar doesn't necessarily make sense in Scotland, but it would seem to me that as a means to develop renewables 
in a global sense, there would need to be some sort of investment between, say, wind firms, solar firms, um, you name it. So I'm just curious what you might have to say about that. Don't really have a don't really have an answer for that. Not something that I've uh, dwelled upon, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> don't go to the gentleman in the centre who's got a microphone. Yes, uh, Philip Spark. I'm I'm a guest uh, this evening. In 2006, this Royal Society produced a report on Scotland's energy. And I was interested that uh, in the early stages, Denmark was the leading country in wind power. Uh, but in the report, it mentioned that the Danish government had stopped building any more wind turbines. And then I was surprised to see at the appendix, Appendix D, it turns out that Denmark, while it was true in the statistics that it was the biggest producer in percentage terms, of wind power, it also was the largest burning of coal. And if you added in the oil and the gas component, Denmark was burning nearly 80% uh, fossil fuel in order to generate its electricity. I just wondered how Denmark's getting on just now. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the, <laughs> the statistic for that, but I mean, it does illustrate the point that uh, wind has got a limited role to play. Um, on average, if it's up to 20%, I think that's quite good for any one country. Denmark can probably absorb more because it's connected uh, into Europe and it's supported by uh, basically hydro stations in Norway. So, Does anybody have in the audience have the answer for Denmark? Hands up, any answer for Denmark? If not, then the third row back, gentleman in the middle. And then uh, at the back, there's somebody else on, on my right. <laughs> Christopher Craig, retired patent attorney. What is the energy balance between the energy needed to build a wind farm and the energy likely to come out of it over its lifetime? Depends how windy it is. <laughs> uh, uh, come off it. <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a reasonable site, I think you're looking at about six months uh, to recover the carbon used in the production of the concrete, the roads, the steel, etc. As, as little as that? Yeah. Six months. And then life expectancy? 20 years nominal, but like most power plant, it'll probably get operated for about 25 years. Just mm -hmm. depends on the cost of maintenance after 20. Yeah. Thank you. I think it was somewhere on, on the right near, near the back. Yeah. Uh, yes, Sonny Jean, uh, Fettis College. Um, if we keep building more and more um, wind turbines, clearly then we'll have to um, upgrade our uh, national grid. And uh, so how much uh, would it cost actually to upgrade it? And uh, do you believe that we actually now need to build a new system together with the EU so we have a kind of combined uh, national grid? Thank you. Hey. I've no idea how much it will cost, but uh, I think it needs renewed anyway. I think it's reached the, the end of its life. The national grid was designed to take power uh, from large uh, remote generators, and the, the whole system's changed where the renewable energy is and where people are is a bit disconnected. So I think you need completely new uh, infrastructure there. And yes, I think it would be a huge benefit if it was connected into to Europe for some of the reasons I've mentioned earlier, security of supply, continuity of supply. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, on, on the, just in the right, gentleman with a dark car. Uh, Pat Gordon, Harriet Watt. I just wanted to ask a personal question, Ian, about whether you've invested in any renewable energy in your own uh, life, and in which case, which one <laughs> is the most uh, profitable to invest in yourself? <laughs> I've made an investment in the uh, LiDAR, but uh, it's difficult to, to do independently. Personally, I've not made any investments in any renewable energy technology because I do a lot of due diligence work and I'm kind of barred from doing that. So I've assessed a lot of technologies, so I don't think it would be fair of me to, or indeed moral, to make investments in technologies that I know could be a winner. I was thinking more in your domestic situation, like in your own house. Personally, I've, I, have, I have a wood-burning stove. <laughs> and no, no generator, no I'm wind generator. I'm progressing, yeah. uh, planning application for a small wind turbine. All right. <laughs> no, it's well away from the trees. Next question, in, in, in the middle, about five rows back, blue. blue. 
jacket. Hi, Robert Clement, University of Edinburgh. I wonder if you could comment on the placement of turbines, uh, land-based turbines, with regards to forestry and the the effective carbon balance with regards to clear cutting as opposed to keyhole placement. I, I would uh, cut the forest down because, uh, well, the commercial forests, because I believe that there's more carbon to be offset with the production of energy from large wind turbines compared to what you'll get from a densely packed uh, forest. Question, uh, right, almost uh, two rows in the back um, on my left. Uh, Bob Cuthbert, um, travelling through central Spain a few years ago, I noticed a, a number of wind farms and uh, basically there was no wind, they were standing still and it makes you wonder if they're sighted in the right place. <laughs> Well, it, it, it happens here. <laughs> February is supposed to be the windy well, Feb well, statistically, February is the windiest month uh, in the UK. Uh, this year it wasn't in Scotland. For what it's worth, as an anecdote, I used to be chairman of Scottish Hydroelectric, and we had an experimental wind generator on the Isle of on Shetland. And when I arrived there to look at it, it was so windy that it could hardly land at Sunborough. Uh, went up to see the experimental wind generator. It had been in shut down that day because the wind was too strong. The next day there wasn't a breath of wind and the wind generator wasn't working. And Shetland is not connected with the mainland by any undersea cable. So there you have classically this, this problem of what backup system do you have if you've got wind generation. And, and you see it absolutely very, very good example on Shetland. And it doesn't always blow on Shetland. Other questions? Yes, uh, on, on my left, about six, seven rows back. Uh, and Tom, uh, I noticed in your, your growth chart there was very little movement in hydro. Uh, what's the main limiting factors there? I believe that most of the, well, if you look at uh, Glendoe, that was the, the first major hydro project to, to come online in uh, decades. Basically, most of the big resource has already been exploited. And it's also very difficult to get a um, hydro project through the environmental permitting process. It's very challenging. I know a community group that's been at it for many years. It's um, front and sec secondary again. And you failed to give your name last time, so perhaps this second chance you can give your name. <laughs> Charlie Briggs here at Watt University. Um, you talked a little bit about um, Offshore turbines will go gearless. I know General Electric are doing that, for example. Um, but I know there's a Norwegian company, Sway, who's working on downwind machines. Do you think we're on the cusp of offshore and onshore machines diverging, not just in terms of scale, but also in terms of design? Uh, yes, I do. Um, there's also a Norwegian company looking at floating wind turbines. And uh, the state of Maine have bought into that technology to try and introduce it to the United States. So, yes, I think you'll see a divergence in the comment I made earlier upon the oil and gas sector actually talking to the wind sector. I think that will help push that divergence ahead. Okay. We're, we're limited in the uh, onshore to, I think it's four and a half metres of a tower that you can transport. So it's difficult to see how much bigger or how much larger turbines would be tolerated onshore in any case. Front, front row again, Mr. Max. And then about um, six rows back, right, right on the end. John Baxter, BP. Ian, we're, this is part of National Science and Engineering Week, this event, and we're trying to encourage young people to pursue science and engineering. So if you had some young people in the audience who are coming to talk to you to say, thinking of doing engineering, obviously going to Strathclyde, which is the right place to go, as you and I know, um, you know and you're interested in renewables, what kind of advice would you give them? Because I was fascinated by your circle that showed inception all the way around to actually operation, you know, so there's reliability issues, many things you covered. Uh, what would you kind of get them thinking about in which directions they might go? Because I think it's so important that we are giving role models, we're giving pathways to young people to think about their careers, to think about the direction that gets them into real engineering, real science. I think it's all about, uh, certainly for me, it's always been about challenges. And 
I think I've presented a whole number of challenges here. There's a, to me, it's a whole new dawn opening up in the understanding of wind flow and wind structure. So, get, showing some of these images, I hope, have stimulated people into seeing the level of interest that there is in, in wind. And uh, in our company, we try and take on graduates for summer placements and generally throw them in at the deep end, so be prepared to, to swim. <laughs> I think there's, a, there's huge and varied opportunities out there. Um, we've got, we've got a, a mixed bag of people, analysts, project managers. Um, it's difficult for me to give specific guidance to specific individuals. We like people that are focused on um, doing a lot of number crunching and quite sadly, personally, I, I get a bit of a kick out of that and, <laughs> and st still go back to it. But people that can think in their feet, um, we've got a lot of young engineers out there that go out in the field regularly. And uh, getting involved in the practical side of engineering, uh, I was helping students at uh, Engineers Without Borders session a few weeks ago at Strathclyde University. And to me, they, they benefited hugely from the practical application of picking up tools and working with them. And uh, I would strongly recommend and encourage that uh, because it's got huge benefits when you're out doing real projects like the things that, that we're involved in. Helps develop the mind and helps you to think in your feet. So go and do something challenging that you didn't think you could do. Well, I know from one of the questions right at the back, we've got some people who are at school at the moment. So there you are. There's a tremendous encouragement. Um, there was somebody a six years on, right on the end. And then we've got time for, I think, about another two questions. Yes, I'll, I'll ask Alexander. Uh, I'm just intrigued as to, as to what's driving the expansion of, of wind energy. Is it standalone wind energy companies or is it uh, energy companies, some of them with finite prospects, I think, particularly of oil and gas, looking at means of diversifying? Hey, both. The, there's a feed-in tariff which is effectively aimed at individuals, communities, uh, factories to, to look at their own renewable energy opportunities. So that's a 20-year a long uh, tariff which is going to hopefully stimulate a, a whole new community of people onshore to uh, look at wind. Offshore the risks are so big that it's, uh, it's, it's going to be driven by utilities. You're never going to see small, I don't think you'll see small companies out there. If you look at the awards, uh, the licenses granted in the Pentland Firth for marine energy, it's, it's basically utility companies that can take the, the development risk. They've got the balance sheet to, to cope with it. So I think there's two areas. Okay, another couple of questions. Uh, right in the middle, halfway back, I'm not sure which end you're going to get. You're going to get two microphones. Uh, I'm Kate Byrne. I have no particular expertise in this field. Um, you showed that uh, at present the contribution of wind energy is very small um, and it's set to grow enormously. And I think you had a graph that showed the onshore. I, I know you've been talking about offshore, but you showed that the onshore was going to grow very considerably. I was wondering if you could give us any idea about what that means in terms of the amount of countryside turning into wind farms in Scotland, particularly. Well, it'll be a relatively uh, small percentage, hopefully ideally situated, situated in locations that have got minimum impact upon people. Whiteley Wind Farm to the south of Glasgow, I think, is a great illustration of a, an appropriately sited uh, large wind farm. It's about 340 megawatts in size, getting expanded up to 500 megawatts, and the feedback from those that live around it is uh, generally positive. Uh, you cannot get a car parked up there on a Sunday because of the interest in people going up there cycling and dog walking. So it's what was a, a large an interesting commercial forest is now a much smaller commercial forest and far more interesting than what it was. <laughs> We've got a last question. 